Hey everyone, Adam and Andrew here with It Takes Two Takes. We are going to talk about episode eight, season two of Warrior. But before we do that, we strongly, strongly, I don't even want to say recommend, we're begging. Subscribe, like, comment. I would actually put that in reverse order. Comment because we like to talk and see what you think about a show, especially like Warrior. So please be engaged. Let's talk about Warrior, Adam. But let's let let's also subscribe. You know, so you can see future videos as well. You yeah, know. I mean, it's part of the list. I don't know that it... <laughs> look, I'll take whatever it is. Whatever clicks you're doing or typing you're doing, do it. Adam, episode eight of Warrior... Was not what I was expecting. It's what? It was not what I was expecting. Um, in, in what way? Mainly when we get to it, when we start talking about a toy. Um, that part. Oh, yeah. The early part is kind of what I expected, right? Uh, I, I think we we talked about it last week. Mayor Blake is dead. Um, you know, Sophie and Penny are alive. A little banged up, uh, but alive. And, They're alive. Uh, Penny protecting Jacob. Sophie... Um, throwing him under the bus because cause she don't want Penny to be listed as the murderer. Yeah, not really seeing this one as a Sophie's choice. Sophie quickly <laughs> throws Jacob under the bus and, you know, we call it like we see it. But yeah, so you know, obviously that leads to a giant manhunt. I do want to take a step back, though, and call out. I did appreciate the fact that while we are eight episodes into what could very well be the final season of Warrior, let's hope not. We did get finally a, a bit of a Buckley backstory, you know, him, uh, you know, his leg amputated in the Civil War. We get we get a little a little bit of who what? this guy is. It doesn't explain the hair washing with the women, but, you know, we got a little bit more of a, a fleshing out of a character. I think we got a little bit closer, though, because we're getting a little bit more backstory. And I watched again the inside the episode and the actor who plays Buckley talked about how he was really actually excited about the scene. So. The, the maggots on the leg, uh, that was his own real leg. They had a prosthetic to show the wound, but he apparently could feel the maggots on his own leg, uh, you know, crawling around. So it was, uh, he was apparently really excited and uh, really kind of looking forward to that, that scene, and he really enjoyed it. Uh, it was neat to, to do it. Um, you know, we get a little bit of backstory. He was in the Civil War. That's where he lost his leg. Based on the time frame, I think we probably could have guessed that, but it was nice to see, um, which makes us understand a little bit more of his obsession with his leg, right? I mean, the very first episode of season one, we saw him massaging right at the knee where his leg was kind of gone, and yeah. so we get a little of a little bit more of an idea of where it went. Um, yeah, yeah that uh, explains the limping, the cane. It, I, yeah, it's uh, it, thought, it's all by design, apparently. I thought it was interesting that the chief of police had to point out to Buckley that he's now mayor. I suppose it's up to you, Mom. You're the acting mayor. Yes. I suppose I am. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would have thought that would have like popped in his head immediately. Like, oh, I'm mayor now. But that didn't even... like wasn't the first thing that popped in his head with the given the situation makes me wonder well, a little yeah. bit whether or not you know uh, which it was in the inside of the episode a little bit i don't you know the actor even said he's not sure that buckley ever wanted that role right he's more of a puppet master than the the one in front of the audience so um yeah it'd almost be like if uh it's like if Chow all of a sudden became the leader of something. It just doesn't feel right. I understand that. And, you know, him being sworn in, I thought, by the way, was a cool little scene. The fact that, you know, uh, it's it's basically Mayor's, Mayor Blake's blood is still fresh. It's still on the floor. It's still being cleaned up in their kind of transitioning between the scene of him getting sworn in. I thought that was a cool little moment. Yeah. And, you know, we've got now this massive manhunt for Jacob. You know, right. uh, chief of police is under orders, spare no manpower, and... uh you know, turn over every little rock in Chinatown and find Jacob. And, and much to really the sort of the politics of the show, it really speaks to it because everyone, you know, this manhunt for Jacob, this action, you could say, of Jacob's has sort of sparked an incentive for a lot of different people. Um, you know, you've got you've got Mei Ling who wants Buckley's help to take down the hopway in exchange for her cooperation. Well, we'll get that. Um, we'll get that shortly. Uh, the the main I think 
interesting thing was they set up a really big dynamic, right? Like, all right, we're road blocking it, no one in and out without police, uh, you know, checking them. There's uh, a curfew. I mean, Lee is on a downward spiral and O'Hare and him are still at horns. But what I think I find interesting about this was the fact that, like, nobody was safe. Even Chow was getting harassed in this manhunt for for Jacob. Um, so I, I, I just, I found that this whole episode kind of revolved around that, with the exception, and <laughs> we start off the episode, wasn't even about, like, when we begin the episode, wasn't even about that moment, right? It was Hong... Assam and uh, Young June having a conversation and Hong explaining about some violin guy mm -hmm. who apparently was great with the violin when he was young and then later on is killing people with his violin strings. Um, and what I, what I loved was how they just kept panning back and panning back and you kind of already saw them covered in blood and you're like, okay, well, what happened? Right. And they just, I love the fact that it was this, here's a story, and they keep panning back, panning back, and then you start seeing the, um, the, the, the carnage that had been left, right? Um, there had been a, a big fight, a big scrap, and while they're sitting there talking, there's a whole lot of dead bodies all laying around. I love I the fact that that was what they started the episode with. Wasn't even about Mayor Blake is what they started with. They started with that. Yeah, I think it illustrates the fact that, you know, with Zing gone, they're just plowing through these people. And we didn't even need to see it to know that that was what was happening. Just kind of an interesting cold open for sure. Which, according to the inside of the episode, they had originally planned to shoot that whole uh, scrap. But there just wasn't the, the time or the production uh, to do it. And so they decided to go instead with this uh, moment, uh, I think they almost compared it to Tarantino of, we're not going to show you what happened, we're just going to let you see the carnage of it, and we're just going to have this intimate story amongst these characters. Um, but that ends up, you know, bringing up Mai Ling, who knows that Assam was behind it. Right. Yeah, and I, I wasn't trying to get into my Ling before. What I wanted to point out was just that the, kind of what you were alluding to when you talk about the sort of the corruption and the way that the police, the San Francisco PD are doing this giant manhunt is, is the fact that Jacob is sort of, his actions are the catalyst for a lot of moving parts. It's very much Game of Thrones-esque if you want to use a more current show, right? The uh, With my Ling wanting Buckley to help take down the hopway, you've got Leary with his own incentive because he wants his men to be deputized so they actually get some work he's feeling the pressure of his position and you know trying to talk down to two dollars an hour to be able to get them involved um buckley has his own political advantage that he is seeking at this point in order to make sure jacob's captured it's all about just catching him to put him in a position to where he's proven himself as a you know a worthy leader let's say or mayor at, at least for the time being and really I mean, we'll get we'll get to it, but ultimately, Jacob really ends up, and and we'll talk about this in a minute. But in my opinion, maybe the, both the best and the worst possible place that you could be. We'll right. see. But. Uh, and there were so much little things that happened, right? You know, whether it be um, Leary seeing Sophie beat up, which he was very visibly shaken by that, and if Mayor Blake wasn't already dead, oh yeah, he would have definitely gone and killed him. Um, that. So, but at the same time, Leary's not like, oh, thank you for this Chinese guy who killed the guy who roughed you up. No, he's just like, we need to get the Chinese guy. Um, so he's still on point about making sure that that's still his agenda. And so Leary, I think, has got the weight of all these Irish people on him. And he's trying to do good by them. But, you know, he's strangled by a political system I feel like that's gonna that's gonna come into play a lot in in either next week's episode or episode ten. Um, you know, Leary's gonna be in a corner, I think, where he's got to do something because he's you know his the Irish are looking to him like you ain't doing nothing. We're paying our dues. You ain't doing nothing, and the politicians are you know keeping him down. You know, They're not uh, taking him seriously. They're annoyed by him. Are you going to? push harder and and join the political system and play that game or are you going to stand your ground and, and fight for the people that you promised things to and i don't think he quite knows the answer yet 
And Leong is a little bit put in his place by my Ling on the whole situation yeah. because, you know, she talks to him and says, you weren't looking at the big picture. And uh, we find out that, you know, the Hopway went after the Fung Hai because they were weak. It's a perfect time to take them out. And instead of burning the building, they put the flag up to kind of send a signal. And my Ling knows it was Assam behind it. And, you know, Father June is even like, yeah, there's probably another way that we could have taken out the Fung Hai without losing good men. Um, right. So even Father June has a hard time, you know, um, congratulating young June. And Father June talks about patience. And it feels like Father June is playing the patience game. Almost like Father June knows he's going to be back in charge because young June doesn't have that patience or the leadership. So it'll be interesting to even see how that dy dynamic plays out. I think Father June had a point in that conversation. There's one thing that was undeniable. The violence is clearly escalating. There's potential chaos that's going to be happening, whether or not it's on young June's doing. But the reality is he's playing into that angle at the moment, and it does seem to be building and building. And we've got the penultimate episode next. I can only imagine what it's going to escalate to. Well, and um, Leon O'Hare came to scraps. I mean, we saw a lot of tension uh, in this episode, right? We, we see did, and we see Leon O'Hare come to scraps because uh, Lee tells him that hey, uh, I know you planted that watch. You know I went and saw the widow, and they right. actually scraps. And Lee is looking rougher and rougher with every episode. You know his addiction is really sure. starting to play, and I'm wondering when we're going to see that act as a powder keg in and of itself. Yeah, it's a. Uh... It's only a matter of time with him as well. There's a lot of stuff building but up, and I feel like O'Hare O'Hare threw his mur the 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 Lee's murder back in his face. Yeah, I mean, the tensions are definitely building. And then you know, while we're talking about uh, O'Hare, you know, Lee and Chow have a moment as well because of this whole curfew thing. It, it's it's really like the the powder keg is get is we're about ready to light it. I think. Um, if the next about the scene with uh, O'Hara and Chow, yeah, just everything yeah. tensions are so high that if next episode it doesn't blow up, I mean, the last episode is going to be an absolute explosion if things don't start to blow up next episode. Because there was some, I wasn't planning on even really. I, it was such a, a brief moment, but you're, there's one thing I would point out: the O'Hara and Chow uh, interaction is there. There was, I feel like a, a moment that I hope wasn't overlooked by anyone watching this that. O'Hara had kind of a moment where he was starting to see how quickly things were unraveling, not just with himself. That's one thing. He's not too worried about that, although that's, that's a factor, sure. But seeing like these, these nobodies acting as cops and treating people the way they were, and even O'Hara in a moment of sort of grace of him just saying to Chow, like, hey, I'm sorry, I, you know, I didn't come through and get your business together when well, I told you I would. I like, think he kind of was relenting there. I think O'Hare's had some amazing growth throughout mm -hmm. the two seasons. Because when we first started, they're just Chinese. They're just they're they're Chinamen. That's all they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't really care. And this episode with Chow, we see him see Chow more like a person or a friend. Yeah. And that's a that's coming a long way for O'Hare from where he started in season one, right? Yep. So I think. I really think we've seen a lot of growth with O'Hare. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, the sergeant, the head of Chinatown, you know, when push comes to shove, who does he protect, right? Because, um, right. you know, uh, Chow is almost like a friend to him at this point, you know, especially since he helped him with Zing. Um, and, you know, Jacob turns, everyone goes to Chow. Everyone goes to Chow, including Jacob, right? Um and ultimately, that's where Jacob got, went. And I want to go there before we talk about a toy because I feel like there's a lot to, to kind of talk about with a toy. Um, you know, so Jacob, at the end of the episode, shows up on Chow's doorstep, even though Chow had just got done saying to O'Hare, uh, yeah, I don't know the guy. Um, and that's where he ends up is right on his doorstep. So uh, that puts Chow in a very interesting position as well. It puts Chow in an interesting position, and that's why I kind of think was I was alluding to earlier, where it's probably the best, both the best and the worst possible place that Jacob could end up. Um, mainly, I mean, your, the, your fate resting in the hands of Chow, that could mean a number of things. It's really, what's the best possible scenario for Chow? And 
we don't know the answer to that yet. No, he could totally use Jacob for leverage because if he turned Jacob over to the cops, that would help him immensely as far exactly. as gaining points with the cops. But, you know, there might be a greater play uh, to do with Jacob at the same time. So it'll be interesting. But ultimately, I think the highlight of the episode happened out of toys. You know, I mean, she she gets told about the curfew and she abides by the curfew and Nellie shows up after the curfew and Nellie invites her out to the the farm and everything like that. They're having a great sweet moment. And then two boys in blue show up and things go south really quickly. And a toy figures that out, right? I mean, she realized like, Nellie, you need to go. Oh, yeah. Um, when when two cops show up and they look like they're wearing like cop uniforms that they had back when they were in college and they're just not fitting right like you know something's up and, and they're taking off the helmet the hats are and they're just like you need to go you know right and look yeah of all things and it was a very um you kind of met we kind of talked about that cold open we kind of missed out let's say on what could have been a interesting action action sequence but it was effective for a cold open it was effective for the message it was trying to deliver this was really the most action we had in this episode was this moment from here oh and it's amazing thought, it was great i loved it i was a bit lukewarm on it it was okay uh, uh, yes she was wounded but there were some i don't know i feel like convenient moves from a choreography standpoint that i believe she was just lucky in most instances not necessarily the skilled fighter that i i know she was but i know she was wounded and this My might be biggest... this might play into the fact i watched the inside of the episode and the actress oh. olivia talked about this where she's always had every time we've ever seen her fight up to this point she had her sword and so she not only had her arms linked she had the swords linked to always stay away from her opponents and here she's caught without her sword she's not an Assam, right? Yeah, she can, you know, she's got some good moves and she's handy, and but she's a lot less effective when she doesn't have the sword in her hand. And we saw that. I mean, she fought off these two very big guys without her sword, and it was a bloody, brutal fight. And I found out one of the things I thought was really great was they didn't use any stu stun actors for her in this scene. That is all the actress. Every bit of that shot, the, that scene was all, all her. Um, so she got to play the 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 hits, the beats, everything. That was all on her. And ultimately, when she finally does get upstairs and gets to her sword, she's really effective when she gets to the thing that she's good with. Right. But before then, she's a lot more awkward in a fight um, without her sword. And so it really wasn't until she got her sword back in her hand that she was truly effective again. And she knew exactly who these guys were and where they came from, you know? Yeah, especially on her own turf. She knows, she, she gets protective. She knows what's going on. My biggest question from all of that really was, was, was really Nellie really interested in helping a toy in this scene? I don't know if you caught that. I mean, like she didn't seem very determined. It makes me kind of question her further because the last time we talked about how their relationship had evolved uh, into a romantic one. And I questioned the whole, how, how quickly she was moving in on a toy sort of business arrangements and whatnot. And I, I kind of was willing to just put that behind me, but then that happened. And I feel like, yeah, she was a little lippy, let's say Nellie, but beyond that, I, well, I mean, what else really... is, what else is, I mean, Nellie, Nelly, other than being lippy, which she started off doing, she eventually went after a guy with a, a broken bottle. I yeah. mean, she tried, but she's not a... She's a lady. Uh, you know, I mean, she spent most of her time being pampered and being the wife of someone important. So... What what did you really expect her to do? She tried. Someone that's someone well, someone that's so determined to help every Asian girl out there that's and being she taken I, advantage of and abuse. Hey, let me finish. Abused, yet she's willing to just walk away. A toy gives her, uh, you know, puts her in her place and says, you know, I don't need any help from you or whatever. And then she's okay, walks away. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of Nelly in this situation. I think, I think Nelly, I, 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 I think, I think Nelly understood that there's a rawness to this this moment that it was better off for her to leave at that moment because a toy was in a very dark place. She had her sword. She's in a very dark she place. cutting off heads. I know, but you know, it, you, 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 you may very well be right. I, I, it's not something I'm determined to say is not the case, but I question her further is all I'm saying. Oh, I agree too.
But, you know, Atoya had other business she needed to get to, and she did not have time for for Nelly. Right. So she needed Nelly gone. And yeah. Atoya got a wake-up call. Her life is a bloody one. It's a dangerous, bloody one. And so, to a certain extent, Atoya is probably living, living a little bit in a fantasy land, you know, with this whole Nelly relationship. Like... It was more of a dream and she's come, sure. you know, she got, she got knocked back to reality really quick. And so she shows up at her partner's house telling him flat out, you're signing, uh, or I'm going to go up and kill your kids where they, where they sleep. Right. And as soon as she laid that thread on, he's writing as quick as he possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's where we left the, you know, really other than obviously Jacob showing up with Chow. I mean, that really was, I thought the most effective ending to this was what happened to a toy. I mean, a toy that was a, a, to me, it was a great, it was a great fight scene for me, but also at the same time, um, it was, uh, it was great to see her do something more than walk around in a new outfit, which is a lot of what a toy's done this season. Yeah. She had the one brothel fight scene and, there was one or two other minor fight scenes, but for the most part, a toy's job has been to walk around the brothel in a new outfit every time. So it was a lot. I really enjoyed seeing her in this this episode a lot. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really think about it until afterwards. It, a Tom probably got at most what five minutes of screen time this entire episode, which was kind of nice. It was just shifting on to really what the impact on all these other characters was for this episode. And that, that might be because they're saving up for ultimately. Now, I did enjoy the interaction between Osam and O'Hare. You know, O'Hare and him mm-hmm. kind of meet back up again. And they had a nice little banter back and forth. You know, especially with Osam saying, I don't know, you all look alike. Um, right. So that was interesting. I got to think either next episode, maybe it, maybe next episode we're going to see uh, maybe another confrontation with o- O'Leary. Uh, with Leary. Between the psalm, I just we've got to be getting there. Um, you know they've been building up for that fight, and I I want it. I want it bad. I want the psalm. I, want it, I fight. don't want it in the last five minutes of episode ten with a cliffhanger. <laughs> right. And last time, last season, they did the big fight um, in the ninth episode. So maybe we'll have a big fight in the ninth episode of this season. Um, who knows? I did find out though this week uh, there is a petition online for a season three of Warrior. So anyone out there who wants to see a season three, there is a online uh, Change.org petition for a season three. So I don't know it'll do any good because I don't know if any Change.org petitions have ever done any good, but there is one out there. I've actually got a Change.org petition out there to see if people will comment on this video, <laughs> like, subscribe. So uh, once again, subscribe. You know, like the video. Comment, ring the bell, all that good stuff, and we'll see you next week for episode nine. And uh, this has been It Takes Two Takes. Hey everyone, Andrew with It Takes Two Takes. We're playing some royalty free music, so don't even bother Shazamming that one. We got videos over here I think you're gonna enjoy, and there's a button over here I'm gonna enjoy. Let's make this all work together, right? Please subscribe, check out what else we have going on. Thanks for watching.